Uh, to kick off the next session, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Heli Offshore's most recently appointed board member, president and CEO of Bristow Group Inc., and my new boss, Don Miller. This is Don's first visit to Heli Offshore, uh, or a Heli Offshore event, and I know he's very much been looking forward to it. Please join me in welcoming Don to the stage. Thank you, sir. Uh, those kind words, um, I may need you to talk to some of our shareholders, if you don't mind. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, a little tough times for us these days, but we'll get through this. So, uh, again, thank you, Tim, as well, for your personal commitment and dedication to Heli Offshore. I, will, I, I would say it reflects, really, Bristow's commitment. Um, you know, as I think about standing here, I've got some big shoes to fill. Obviously, Bill Childs, uh, this was the brainchild for Bill. I can actually remember, he referenced 2013. But I can remember the initial discussions that uh, that Bill had about this, and it is true. This is my first, in fact, heli offshore meeting and my first AGM. So it's great, Bill, to see how far it's come, and what you've done with this, and what and what it's doing for the industry, as well as Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan Bailiff, our prior CEO's commitment to uh, to improving safety and in, in heli offshore. So again, I'd like to thank both of them. But uh, good afternoon and welcome. This is the uh, system reliability and resilience discussion. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm measured in seconds. Uh, I'm the shortest of the probably presentations today, other than Tim's introduction. As a newbie uh, on the uh, board, I've had very little to do, other than I did get a quick glimpse into what you're about to see yesterday. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a continuum now, in um, that now you're going to actually see some of the data collected and put into action. Uh, so over the next 60 minutes, what you're going to see is a real true collaboration amongst OEMs and operators uh, around reliability and resilience, particularly two areas, return to base and human, human hazard analysis. I'd like to thank all the OEMs and the operators that participated in this. In fact, over the next 60 minutes, Dave will actually, uh, who's been running this work stream, will actually introduce uh, a couple of different operators and then uh, I think up to three OEMs that have actually contributed to this and been working on this data over the last 12 months and a lot of good work uh, has been done with that. So it would be uh, very difficult to actually deliver this type of uh, results and feedback and learn from everything we've done over the last year without the contributions of all of them. So I'd like to thank them. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Dave Balovic. Um, he's chairman of the Technical Steering Group and the quarterback for this work stream. Uh, when he's not focused on this work stream in his spare time, he's also senior vice president at CHC for engineering and operations. So Dave, thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, you're right, we're gonna cover a lot of information today. Um, and actually, our, our goal, if you recall last year, is we got up here and we talked a lot about process and what we were doing. Uh, and we asked, we asked for a commitment. We got that commitment from the audience, and from that we launched a lot of activities. Today, the results want to be presented to you, and to that end, we're going to ask for three of the OEMs and one of our operators to get up. I'd like to introduce them ahead of time, just to save a little bit of time in the presentation. So you're going to hear speaking today Jamie Renna, who is the Chief Engineer of Commercial Programs at Sikorsky, uh, Gilles Bruneau, who is the Head of Aviation Safety, as we all know, at Airbus, also, uh, Matteo Ragazzi, who's going to be the head of uh, airworthiness at Leonardo. And then finally, we're going to ask Lee Holland to speak a little bit. Um, Lee is the group fleet support leader at Bristow. So if I talk first a little bit about what's going on with return to base, again, the, the goal here is to not talk too much about the process, but really kind of show you the results. And I think a lot has happened over the last couple of years, excuse me, last couple of months. I think it's been a couple of years getting here, and I wish we had gone faster. Um, but what can we say? Here is where we are in the safety performance model. Um, return to base is the one that's highlighted in yellow right there. Just a short update. We, we all know that's the charter that we took on as an organization. What return bases are, um, a definition that's up there. I think an important couple of words that jump out to me are that, that number one, this is an interruption, is what an RTB is. It's in a deviation from the flight plan. And I think we would all agree that when, when our pilots are flying aircraft, we want them to have as few interruptions and surprises as possible. That would be one reason that a person would suggest going after RTBs is a good thing. Number two, um, 
we heard a little bit from Tony about the fact of this perception of safety in, in the rotorcraft space. This is another thing, obviously, we all know sitting on an aircraft and getting turned back is not um, something would, that would be perceived as safety. So from, from, from those two, I just want to emphasize that the whole goal of this work stream is only focused on, it has nothing to do with, with trying to say we don't want to do RTBs. It has to do with collecting the data, doing something with that data, taking action on it, and hopefully, if we consider that an RTB is a defect, eliminating the defect. And that's where the uh, OEMs really come into, into play here. So just a couple of quick slides on exactly what we did. We went out two years ago. We got a lot of data, data from 11 operators. You see there 4,300 technical reports. So those are essentially each operator contributing, I had an RTB, this is what happened, this is the situation. Those data were collected on six, six aircraft type. Let me just dig a little bit deeper. Take an example from 2016. This is the data that we collected from that study in 2016, and you see that there's about 850 reports. If you scale that or normalize that for an entire year across all operators, it would be a little over 1,250. Um, that says three RTBs to a day. And, and I don't think anybody in the audience would agree that, that that's unacceptable. So we wanted to get after what to do there. The next step we took was to take those data and to break them not only down by ATA chapter, but within the ATA chapter, the actual fault that was recorded. Then, with those data, present them to the OEM, because it's type specific, whether it be an engine or whether it be an airframe, and then ask them to dig into that data. And that's exactly what we want to do next, is to ask um, three OEMs to come and speak to us a little bit more about what exactly they've done with those data. So to that end, we're going to kick it off with, um, with Jamie, like I said, uh, who will walk us through, I think, some terrific work and hopefully tee up some provocative discussion that you will do okay. Thank you, Dave, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, mentioned, I have an opportunity to speak to you about this RTB analysis and, and what we did at Sikorsky. So uh, I spoke to some of you in Atlanta with an update on how uh, Heli Offshore got together and published this report, uh, gathering uh, information from all the operators of why they were returning to base and just a couple of months ago. I got a report, Leonardo got a report, and uh, plopped it on our desk and we said, uh, you know, do something with this, tell us about it. So I came back, uh, or excuse me, I said, and Heli Offshore had these uh, goals embedded. These are the words that came right in the report, and I, it really resonated with me, and as you just heard from Dave, is, well, certainly we want to reduce the number of return-based events. And, and, and for that, and with that objective, we're going to improve the safety by reducing the crew workload. We're going to improve the safety perception amongst the, the passengers. Uh, it is nothing but unsettling. It is not just a, a nuisance or an inconvenience if an aircraft is doing a U-turn or, or not, uh, not dispatching or everyone's favorite being stuck on a rig, right? That's, that's, that's not a nuisance event. That is a significant event, and we better make sure we understand why it happened and what are the consequences. And when it does happen, whether it was needed to happen or not needed to happen, it puts a strain on the rest of the enterprise to now react to that. New, new flight schedules have to be made, new crews gathered, and the tempo has been disturbed, and that has the op opportunity to introduce safety hazards that we never intended. So uh, why am I here? Uh, Heli Offshore, again, said not only collected all this data, but provided a copy to me uh, as the chief engineer and within it, it contained uh, over 1,000 RTB events sampled from just eight of our operators in a five-year window beginning in 2013. And that hurt. That hurt just to say that to you. And I said, okay, I got it. I, I picked up the report. And I'll say, I'll tell you what. I'm going to look at your data, raw as might be, and there's some simple Paredos in it. And I'll say, I'll tell you what. I'll look at this data and confirm for all of us that I recognize the root cause. If our operators are telling us something is causing them to U-turn, I should, I should know about it. Um, I'll tell you, if I do know about it, is its priority to be fixed consistent with you know, our own internal reliability and maintainability data. That seems like a reasonable request. And I said, I'll tell you what, I bet I have projects in play, uh, started, contemplated, in some cases finished, to attack some of these, and I'll give an update for that, and, and off we went. 
So extracting, this is a, uh, a screenshot, if you will, right from the report uh, where they, this is for S92 exclusively, uh, gathered the reasons for the return to base events and paraded them by frequency and said, uh, hey, that's, uh, if you could just get rid of all those, uh, we'd, be, we'd be improved. Um, but the thing was, I, I looked at that, not only was it, was it daunting to look at it as is, but it only represented 50%. And I was like, oh, oh, oh my, if, if I figure out how to solve all those things, I still have 500 events in a, in a five. That, 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 seems, that seems wrong. So I, uh, I uh, gathered my staff uh, to discuss this and with this piece of information in front of us and I gathered it into my office, my leadership team and I uh, brought them in and had this on the desk and I uh, closed the door and I said, um, really? And that was the same way I started a conversation with my son when he brought home his ninth grade report card, <laughs> which is, which was a similar feedback. And um, so we looked at this and I said, come on, uh, what, what's, what, what's going on here? How, how, could this, how could this be continuing? We need to look into this and understand this. Uh, do you recognize these things? Are we working on these things? Are we making on progress with these things? So they ran down the hall and uh, they soon came back and said, uh, yeah, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, we know about, we're not real, real proud about, but uh, despite 15 years of service and a million and a half flight hours, we still have some issues. Some of these have specifically been addressed and nearly eliminated. Others we've made progress for, others we don't really have a good idea of what's causing it, and we got more homework to go. And then, but still, I had another collection where we had to have some deeper conversations. And they had a couple of different reasons, so one is, it didn't seem to match our reliability and maintainability data internally of like, uh, we didn't know that this part was failing or causing this, how, how could that be? And then when our fourth highest Pareto item on our list was, I don't know, uh, we, we said, this can't be right. Uh, we got all sorts of computers and sensors on this aircraft and, 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 and we actually are providing information that they can't decipher the fourth most frequent time, uh, frequent reason for a return to base. I said. Uh, th this isn't right and, and I'm not happy. Uh, so I said, you know, we gotta, we gotta look at this a little bit more holistically and see what, what, what actually might be our problem here. And I, I said, you know, team, uh, while this isn't easy to do, this is what everyone wants to do every morning. And it's not putting a man on the moon. I said, see those airports to the left? Uh, they don't move. Uh, you see that oil rig? It moves pretty slowly, if it moves at all. Uh, it said, so we pretty much know where they are. It said, you know, even most of our operators in this industry, they don't even fly at night, you know, or if the weather is below certain minimums, they don't even operate there. And I said, all they want to do is load up their people and take them out safely to a rig and gather another group of people and bring them home safely. And, and, and so we seem to be struggling with that compared to this data. In fact, when I showed them this, I said, this is what has actually occurred according to this data, again, a thousand plus times on an S92 alone in that five-year window where indeed they started off on the blue track and they took off and they had the passengers all loaded up and somewhere along that uh, flight trajectory, a uh, fault of some, court, uh, some uh, type occurred, maybe a small one, maybe a big one. Um, that fault was enunciated to someone, at least the flight crew, sent to a maintenance computer, all the way back to flight operations, where have you. And a small group of people then were forced to make a return to base decision based on the information that they was provided to them in that very dynamic environment. And again, a thousand times or so, they made the decision to do a U-turn and brought those people back to a return to the base event. And I wasn't really happy with the quantity that this has occurred. And I would say roughly a third of the staff at this point was staring at their shoes and weeping quietly, um, which is typical for my staff meeting uh, for a lot of reasons. So anyway, so, uh, so we said, no, this isn't good. I said, well, you know, we gotta, we gotta do more. We, we gotta rethink it. We said, well, you know, certainly uh, state-of-the-art reliability, well, that'll kill it. You know, it's like, we, we gotta full bone, right? So uh, tell you what, we're gonna get this green medicine and we're gonna put this on here and we're gonna just nip this thing. 
and we're going to have state-of-the-art reliability, and when we do have that, we're going to have far, far less faults in the first place. Well, that's cool. And if we have far, far less faults, then we're going to have very little to enunciate. There's going to be much to talk about. And if we have very little enunciation going on, there's going to be very few decisions that need to be made by those crews, and more often than not, the blue completed circuit um, can help. So we said, okay, well, are we doing that? You know, because we owe it to our people. I said, oh, you know, we have one, let's, let's just, like, there's an example of us avoiding a fault, and we have one where our aircraft have engines, those engines have fire detectors on them, and we've had events where there's been uh, enunciation of a fire in the engine compartment, but turned out to be false. So we have this diagram here, there's an engine, please don't burn, and we had a little gizmo there that would, would sense it. And, uh, you know, who knew that, um, there's vibrations on helicopters, might don't jot that down. And uh, sensors don't really like to be vibrated all the time, and we found that the wire harnesses and the sensors weren't always working all the time, and, and when that would result in a false engine fire enunciation to the crew, and they would be doing the returns. So we took some actions, and we beefed up the thing, and we changed the wire harness, and we got some things out of the way, and we measured the data, and I'm happy to report that we had a dozen or so per year in the old configuration, and we put some new information out, and got some new hardware out into the hands of our customers, and it looks like it's, it's crushed, and we're very happy to that. The bad news is I wish I had 50 more examples like this one. I don't. What I do have is 50 more examples of giving it the old college try. So here's one where I'm trying to avoid the fault, but I'm standing in front of my peers and colleagues here where I tell you I haven't won. And that would include main gearbox chips. So that uh, diagram on the left is a main gearbox, and the diagram on the right is the chips that can be detected with, via chip detectors. They're millimeters or centimeters in size. And our current protocol is if that was to occur, we don't see it the front crew, and they get a chip detector, and they take appropriate actions. And so we've obviously been working very hard to minimize those. I know an entire industry does to minimize these events. And I could show you 20 examples of projects I've done. I'll just share with you, like, most recent three is where I've attacked uh, coatings and surface finishes and improved timing on planetary gear systems, all for an effort to make this problem go away. Um, I can say we've made progress. Um, but the issue is not, has been mit, what I would call mitigated but not eliminated. We keep track of how often these occur, we've had them go up, we've taken actions, the parts down there, it's better. So I, I, I couldn't get there. I, I, I hope to get there someday, but I, in realistic, I, I have, frankly have more of these than, I, than, than the prior example. So we said, you know, this reliability thing may not get us there. Not, not all by itself. We're never going to stop uh, striving for perfect reliability, but we might need something more. So we've had a discussion within Sikorsky, one I'd like to continue in this organization, where we have to start talking about uh, taking advantage of the intelligence on the aircraft uh, that's there today and what could be there tomorrow, of what I'll call smart enunciation protocols, and such that it can digest that information and understand what needs to be communicated to who, uh, such that even fewer decisions have to be made you know, inside the flight crew. So questions that are being rolled around within Sikorsky is, you know, what message is to be enunciated. What, what am I going to tell them? Um, who's going to get the message? Is it going to get transmitted to somebody off the aircraft, to the aircraft, all of the above? Um, when's it going to be transmitted? Uh, immediately, after a secondary indication, after the end of the day? It depends on the severity. This is a significant adult conversation, frankly. And what actions are expected when we send it? You know, I, I don't like, I've never liked the idea of, well, just turn on the yellow light so everybody worries faster. You know, it's like, what, what, what did we gain there? I want, to, I want to give them something actionable to improve their situation. So the good news is, I think this can be done. And I've done a lot of reading on the, in the fixed wing industry and the ETOP and the evolution of the ETOPS rules and what have you. And they went through and, and kind of paved this road, and I think we can follow them, where uh, with an industry-wide collaboration, beginning with the OEMs and their hazard assessment and what, what do their aircraft do, what do the components, how do they degrade if at all, and what does it mean? Our FCOM conversation that we've heard about several times throughout the conference, the maintenance program of what needs to be done by what people in what order, and the minimum equi equipment lists are, th are not integrated enough, I think, to take full advantage of the intelligence on our aircraft to actually make a difference. And the good news is the building blocks, I think, for us to do here, beginning with, most importantly, the fail-safe design that many of our products have earned that reputation, but building your way up the uh, uh, steps of the pyramid of, let's think of, the, uh, success is not defined by just safely getting from the air to the ground. 
Success is completing the mission. Maybe it's completing the day. Maybe it's completing the week or the month and not just getting me to the ground. We're beyond that. We have capabilities and I think we're setting the bar too low if that's where we define success. We have architectural robustness and component reliability work still ahead of us, but I think progress has been made. Displaying important things to the flight crew of what they need to know and how they can act upon it. And with this conductivity we have in the modern age of being able to transmit information almost around the globe instantaneously, we have building blocks to get us there. So I'll leave you with is, I think there's a future state out there for us. It's one where for sure there's state-of-the-art reliability that, and we're not there yet today to nip this as early as possible. But when teamed up with smart enunciation, there may indeed be genuine reasons for an absolute return to base. And that's what we're gonna do, and we're gonna have that logic make that crystal clear to the to crew if that's the most important action. But if it's not, I'd like to have the inner loop continue. This is a, a shout out to my friends in Flight Controls Engineering, where the inner loop continues and they can complete that mission where simultaneously an outer loop takes place and the logisticians and the planning people can get ready and get that aircraft prepped for its next mission. So the conclusions I've come with in my uh, in time here uh, from this report is, uh, yeah, sure, the, re the return to base root causes and the priority correlate with our internal reliability data. We remain committed to enhancing uh, reliability, but we need to do more. I think there are opportunities for improved system safety that may be present in the fault enunciation protocols. And again, I think our fixed wing friends actually have led the way on this. And really the perception of safety, even if the actual safety, but the perception of safety, in my opinion, will not improve without industry-wide collaboration. This can't be done by one OEM, it can't be done by one operator. This is something where an organization like this, in my opinion, is perfectly suited to continue this conversation. So, Thank you for your attendance on this important topic. Simple, huh? Yes. Seems to be simple. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to speak to you about the return to base of the 175. So that is a big difference compared to your helicopter. It's a, it's a young helicopter. And so we have uh, two years of experience with this helicopter. So we had uh, 98 return to base declared by the operator over the past uh, two years. And finally, you, we had data from uh, uh, seven operators, mainly from uh, LE offshore community, but not only. And we, we figure out that we have uh, almost 29 uh, events from the ATA 63, we'll see what it is afterwards, and 30 from the ATA 52. What does it mean? You have the whole list of, of the events, and finally, if you look at the 80% of the return to base uh, were caused by 10 different types of uh, issues. And if you look more in detail, if you focus on the two main ones, 60% of our RTB are caused by two uh, types of, uh, of issues. So we are pragmatical. We uh, have decided to focus first on these two items that we call door locking and chip warning. You can see that uh, we are not the only one having chip warning on main, main gearbox. So let's start by the, the first one. Uh, we call it chip warning, but chip warning can come from mainly two different things. Spoolings, as it was explained by my colleague from Sikorsky, but also it can come from pollution. Cleanless in the main gearbox uh, are key. So we have been working for, uh, for months now, and we will continue. We are working on improving the main gearbox bearing spooling on reducing, improving the cleanliness of gearboxes. The good point is that the detection system works well uh, in this situation, but it's not good for, of course, for return to base. So, for the spooling uh, problems, we have uh, decided to launch a, a kind of uh, improvement of the design on uh, 11 bearings of the main gearbox. So it uh, has been certified yet by uh, my friend David Solar. Uh, so it's uh, EASA certified and it will be deployed in the coming, uh, coming uh, months and years uh, in the main gearbox of the 175. 
We are working also uh, hardly on a cleanless program because finally uh, some, we can have some uh, very small particles coming from the manufacturing process and finally only small particles can generate uh, chip warning. So we have really to focus on small particles and to introduce new industrial means to perform decontamination uh, operations. So practically, uh, so the project begin, began uh, in 2018, beginning, and we uh, implemented a first plan, and the complete plan is targeted to be finished by end of 2019. So we have decided to reinforce the, what we call the acceptance test procedure when the main gearbox are uh, going to, before uh, going to flight. So I will not go into the detail, but I will comment uh, uh, this slide, the additional one, because it has a lot of improvement in the process uh, for uh, cleaning uh, the main gearbox. What is important is uh, this uh, scheme where you, we ca you can see uh, on the top of the slide that we are working uh, on the manufacturing side before assembly to put some, uh, some barriers to clean, clean the parts. And we are working also on uh, after assembly, uh, before the test, at the beginning of the test, to flush uh, the main gearbox so, with a specific uh, industrial means. So on the elementary parts, we have a machine which is already in service, uh, which is uh, working on uh, cleaning the small parts. And we will introduce progressively this year uh, different machines. The first one focusing on housing lubrication lines because we have some specific housings with very, very small lines, and we need to, to clean uh, these lines. So it's the target is to, to have it uh, Q3 2019. We, ha are, we are working also on a machine for uh, cleaning uh, big parts, uh, which will, uh, uh, is planned to, to arrive Q4 2019. And we have also something to analyze the process, uh, extraction analysis tool, uh, to, to better understand, to, to see if the processes are uh, improving over time. On the right side, for the MGB flushing uh, bench, so we have already in place uh, some, uh, uh, some machine which uh, allow to, to turn and to move uh, the main gearbox, and so to, to, uh, to, have, uh, to be more efficient when we flush the, the main gearbox. And it is what we have started to do on the 175, and we will continue to do on the 225 and on the 160. So, I have finished with the first one. Remember, we have two, two, two topics. The first one was the warnings, the chip warnings. The second one is the door warning. Uh, so we have a system on the 175 where there are a lot of uh, uh, warning for the door, cockpit doors, cabin doors, uh, emergency uh, EPU doors and cargo doors. Um, so there are different systems, but globally speaking, we have uh, too many uh, alarms. So it can be seen at the doors with the, with, the, with the tools on the left side. But of course, for the pilot on the Helionics uh, system, you can see what are the warnings, and you can see it can be a left, uh, left door, etc., EPU doors, uh, etc. So uh, we have to uh, reduce this kind of, uh, of alarm. So we have performed a complete analysis of where, on which doors we have alarms. We have <laughs> warnings coming from almost all of them. And uh, something we correlate is that there is a lot of alarm which happen just after uh, 800 or uh, 1,600 uh, hours uh, inspection. So we have been focusing on that to improve the situation. So uh, we have been working on uh, uh, some improvement and further investigations are still in progress. But we have identified things that can be improved short term and long term. Short term is that we call, we call uh, protective measure or on containment measure, in fact, the same. So there is an action plan for that. We have released a video uh, for uh, the operator so that they can better work and better understand what has to be done when they, they, uh, they do something on the doors. We also uh, will improve the flight manual procedure. By now it's done, the safety analysis is performed. If you reduce the speed below 140 knots, you are able to, to come back, uh, not to, to continue the flight without a return to base. 
uh, and we will also do uh, some uh, some uh, evolution in the maintenance uh, working cart uh, and also providing some uh, some uh, spare parts to the operator so it's what we call a short term measure and we have also a, a corrective measure in progress so a design that we are working on that uh, will be released by a future uh, a future service built in so conclusion is by doing these two uh, modification on the doors on the ship warning we will reduce globally by 50% the number of RTB so it's uh, the beginning of the journey it's not the end but I would say a good start so can you hear me okay so I will not go through all the griefs of uh, uh, finding the right uh, reason for a problem that my colleagues have been already uh, been able to uh, get you through. Uh, I think that uh, we can say we were the late comer in the R2B exercise. Uh, we were pretty much reluctant to get into that because uh, we felt we had a lot of processes already in place, in, in effect, uh, that could uh, do the business. Or better, what we learned along the way is that, yes, we do have processes, not that much tuned to something happening in flight. They were more tuned to the airworthiness relevance to the, of, of the occurrence. Um, in essence, we were not considering any distinction between something happen, that happens in flight or something that happens uh, uh, a surprise that happens in a scheduled maintenance, for example. So we were actually uh, entering very cautiously in this uh, exercise, uh, and we focused more on the maintenance side, which is the area where we can actually put our hands more easily. So that's where we worked upon. Uh, if you look at uh, 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 us, we are a very much uh, a strongly opinion company. But normally, the way that we have to go is more data-driven. So we had to uh, set up a process uh, that is more or less what we were doing for something else. But on the right-hand side, in the corner, you can see aircraft configuration. Uh, that is not a secondary point. We keep doing improvements to our aircraft design. The point is that uh, we were not able to understand how effective they were. So it's something you already heard. In this, uh, from this podium uh, today. So we had to set up a process just to find out that many of the instances were actually assigned to the wrong attack code, for example, the wrong system. So we were going from a symptom, a symptom to the root cause. So the troubleshooting exercises you've seen, that's exactly what you have to do a thousand times, in essence. So uh, we were actually finding that we had already a tool in our hands that was launched in 2015. Uh, in 2015, we were pretty much uh, frustrated by the lack of closed-loop feedback on our configurations and feedback on the improvements. Uh, if you want to know if something that you have improved is working, you have to take occurrence reports, MORs, uh, warranty claims, uh, orders for spare parts, uh, and emails. That's the reality. Okay, so we wanted to have something a little bit more effective, and we launched this reliability data sharing group. Okay, that was basically effectively what we have been talking about today, talking about parts, but uh, sharing in a very cautious way the re real reliability of parts uh, in a way that could be actually seen as helpful for the customers. So the project was launched in 2015. And we were very much, uh, uh, let's say, nasty on operators to please subscribe to this project, <laughs> frankly, over the years to make it effective. Uh, you can imagine that the number of components that we were looking at uh, tracking were uh, numerous. We're talking more than 1,000, for example. And we've been actually uh, being able now to extract uh, information like, for example, geographically based information, so type of operations based things and something like that. So what we did was we, we tweaked this tool to actually accept RTB, not only airworthiness classification, but also RTB classifications, in that sense. That's what we've been doing uh, in, this, uh, in this last uh, area. And uh, we basically are launching that RTB uh, in the RDSG as one of the parameters you can actually check 
uh, when you subscribe to the program, which is not something that is actually costing money. The program is intended to be for free. Okay. The only problem is that uh, it's a, it works very better, uh, better if it's a B2B from the operators and our, and our uh, organizations. Uh, so the bottom line, that's what, it, what, we, what we did. So maintenance-based, uh, we keep on it. We're just doing uh, uh, the uh, RDSG to be the right tool for the, uh, the customers, and that's what we plan to do in the next, uh, in the next months. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. So the operator takes reliability data in a completely different light from an OEM. We obviously maintain and fly aircraft. We're not only interested in system design and component reliability, we also want to look at how we manage our maintenance systems and how we can manage the systems in the aircraft. We can all be really confident that all the operators around the world will generate a report within their SMS when an RTB event's going to occur we can also be confident that the SMS systems through varied methodologies will analyze the root cause of that report. And there may be no need to take any further action should it be found that the RTB was driven by a technical event. We can also be confident that if it was driven by a technical event, that an engineering reliability program would look at that event, also try and analyze the root cause. And if we saw that that technical issue was trending, the engineering department would take appropriate actions. So that's guaranteed. We know that's going to happen. The RTB working group all agreed with Jamie, just to focus on the S92 for now, that in the most part this works. The information that we gathered around the 1,000 events on the S92, the main drivers had been addressed through reliability programs and issued fielded effective repairs by Sikorsky. It's not the case for every item. You might have noticed that the top two driver for the S92 was classified as autopilot failure. <coughs> We'd already noticed this in our SMS program some months previous, so it wasn't a surprise to see it on the list, but we'd instigated a deep dive, a combined effort from engineering and operations, because although we could see a trend in SMS reporting for autopilot failure, we also knew that the S92 autopilot was fundamentally reliable and its components. It wasn't trending in my reps, it was only trending in Pyreps. So from that analysis, we gathered the slip specialists, the fleet specialists, and the chief, chief training captains. They'd find a number of interesting items. The first one being that 70% of the autopilot failure SMS reports resulted in a no-fault found maintenance action. The other interesting point was that we knew that it was subsystem failures driving an autopilot degrade and not an autopilot foul. That's a really interesting point. So out of that analysis, it was quite clear that we're not seeing autopilot failure. There's a different approach needed and we can find some different results if we combined engineering and flight ops data and expertise along the way. I think the main point is that we can combine our knowledge, we can try and understand better what's driving the reports and what actions can we take out of that analysis. And what we're really trying to do is inform crews that they do need to be accurate in their reporting. We do need to classify SMS reports correctly and understand what we're telling the SMS system. We also need to understand that certain cockpit habits could induce an undesirable cockpit configuration that could induce a degraded situation. We want to reduce the amount of time we fly with an autopilot degraded, obviously. So we take an action to combine SMS data into our reliability program. That gives us the opportunity to take an event, an event focused analysis approach to supplement the traditional statistical analysis that's managing the maintenance program effectiveness. That's given us a platform to look at events that might not happen so frequently but do have a high operational impact. And we can take that to another forum if the reliability analysis doesn't identify the need for a redesign or a change in system maintenance. The essential part of that is to engage with flight ops to understand exactly why we did the RTB. Was it indeed necessary in the first place? That's a, a real key part of the actions that have been taken. So the working group as a whole has committed to a number of swim lanes to try and reduce the number of RTB events. 
The first being to standardise the methodology for data collection across their own operations. The next, to analyse the RTB events against statistical reliability data. We want to complete a review of RTB events for each type that's in operation. So far, we've been very focused on the S92. It's where the majority of the data sat originally. We're going to engage with flight ops, so take the information that we learn and put that in front of the flight ops groups. That's an important part. Peer reviewing our methodologies is important. Are we taking the right steps to move this forwards? And then the last swim lane is to periodically review the findings as a working group to see if we can find any enhanced understanding of cross-fleet and operator issues. The last swim lane is a really important one to the working group because really to be able to understand what's going on with the helicopters as we uh, advance in technology, there's new um, emerging issues for operations and engineering to overcome. And there's a potential that if we combine the knowledge from flight ops and engineering, that we may identify needs for the whole industry in a maintenance area, potentially EWIS training, underlying issues that go across fleet, across operators. We could potentially look at our policies and procedures and how effective they are to reduce our TV events as well. So there's a lot of advancement that can be made through collaboration in the two departments in an operator. The part I'd like to take away from this is not only uh, the, the power of the working group, um, it's also the ability to address other concerns in the industry that have been mentioned today earlier on this morning, uh, land immediately affects. If we had clean and collected data, we could be focused on the systems and components that would drive a land immediately effect until we see aircraft design advancing. The other area that hasn't been mentioned much today, but um, it's really key to me and the team I've been working with, is critical component awareness and how we can monitor the performance of critical components against, against the expectations. How do we identify them? How do we gather the information around critical components and share that as a group of people with the intentions that we really all want to see come through to light? So I leave it with that. It's short, it's sharp, but for sure we can only get this collaboration working with the with the buy-in from everybody in the room, we need the time, we need the resources, there's a lot of work to be done collaboratively, not just from the OEMs, but the operators too. We won't fix this all by just redesigning the aircraft and the systems. We have to think about flight ops too. It has to be part of this working group. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. In addition to collaboration, I'd ask you also to um, to thank the speakers for their transparency. A lot of information that was shared, some of it I'll say um, maybe even uncomfortable, but thank you for that, because I think that's exactly what we need. So, continuing on, we want to spend a few minutes and talk about the human hazard analysis and the results that we've gotten from that activity to date. Um, again, I'm going to ask um, uh, Gilles and Matteo to stick around and talk a little bit about the work that they've done on three aircraft types there. Um, with that, let me just remind you briefly of um, okay, thank you. Um, human hazard analysis. So, so really the focus here is to go after, um, I think as Audrey said this morning, was, uh, excuse me, the, the, the fact that we, we make aircraft, we don't fly them. And so it's that collaboration between the two that is necessary. And that's really what we're talking about in the HHA analysis, is getting the operators who have been using the aircraft and understanding the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then transferring that back to the design teams and the design functions and saying, okay, so what is it in there that needs to be addressed? So really the focus we're gonna talk about for the next 20 minutes is the activities that have brought the engineering teams and the operators and the maintainers together. How did the process work? What have we learned? And what have we gone after addressing so far? With that, let me please turn it over to, um, to Jill. I'm back. On this one will start to be easy because uh, I have pre prepared some slides for today, but we have also prepared a movie. Well, the movie was not ready till yesterday. And finally, yesterday, I got the movie. So now it's very easy, but uh, it does not work. According to our statistics on our fleet, over 6% of helicopter accidents are caused by human error in maintenance operations. This is something that can be avoided. As a helicopter manufacturer, we have a part to play in addressing this situation, which is exactly what we are doing with the human hazard analysis. 
The first phase involves performing a safety analysis to identify important or critical parts where a failure could have serious consequences. Then we list the maintenance task involving these parts. The list is then submitted to maintenance operator internally or to our customers. They are asked to assess the human error risk on the basis of five criteria. If one of them is equal to or higher than three, the task is identified as being sensitive and must be studied in detail. At this stage, we go and work on the helicopter. An operator carries out a maintenance task, employing the procedures and the resources set out in the documentation in place. Using international standards, we assess with him his physical constraints, mental workload and his work organization constraints in each stage of the operations. Each maintenance task requires approximately 30 hours of work, including 4 hours on the helicopter. Based on the objective criteria, this detailed analysis enables us to set up new safety barriers which can involve modifications of the following procedures, documentation, tools, and sometimes even the design. The safety barriers allow us to reduce the human error risk below the limit we have set. The process began in 2018, starting with the H225 and the H175. It will be rolled out onto the H160 soon. It's an extensive job that involves hundreds of maintenance tasks. We are determined to stay in the course and see the analysis through to its conclusion. Flight safety is and will remain our priority. So I hope you have understood the principle. Uh, just to, to be a little bit uh, to explain a little bit more uh, the process which was explained uh, briefly in the, in the movie. First, we identify the critical part and the important part. It's an it's a Airbus helicopter uh, classification, mainly it's part where you, if, if you break the part, you, you have a catastrophic event. After, when you have identified this uh, CP and IP, you identify all the maintenance tasks linked to this critical part. After third step, you determine the, ma the maintenance task showing a possible uh, human error. And after, you perform the systematic analysis on the helicopter itself. So it's a method which has been uh, uh, set up by Airbus Fixed Wing at the beginning. And after, we, we adapted it to the helicopter world and we worked uh, on it with, uh, with HeliOffshore. And last, last thing, to, uh, we uh, implement safety barrier at, as it was explained in the movie. Hmm. I'm sorry, it seems to be blocked. Okay, some, some concrete results. Uh, on the 175, uh, the number of uh, uh, safety critical tasks reviewed is uh, 221, so it's around 200, so it's a lot. Uh, the number of tasks where finally, after the rating of the different tasks, we choose them for mitigating them, it's uh, at around 100. And today, so you have seen, it's a long, uh, long it's a hard work because you need a lot of time to perform the things on the helicopter. Uh, we have scheduled uh, 30 tasks for 2019, and we will release, we have planned to release a tech pub, tech pub release uh, Q2 2019 till Q1 2020. We did a similar work on the, on the 225. Perhaps I, I have to press very hard, I don't know. <laughs> okay, sorry, it's okay. Oh no, I have to be back now. Yes, on the 225, you can see the number, the order of magnitude that's the same. 205 tasks, uh, critical part, task uh, where we have to mitigate. So we have uh, scheduled uh, 35 in 2019, and today we are releasing uh, 10 uh, TechPub uh, working cards, including two videos to help the operator to perform the maintenance task. One example on the 175, the main rotor head uh, damper ball bearing plate check. What we want to avoid is uh, the frequent removal uh, on installation of the damper. So we have defined a new procedure uh, for a ball bearing plate check without removal of the bearing, because before it was mandatory to remove uh, the, the bearing. We have developed a new tool also to perform the inspection, 
and we will uh, provide the maintenance documentation uh, mid-2019. We have also a future evolution which is planned, which is a new design which would allow uh, to uh, keep the electro elastomeric ball end only with a visual check and without any uh, com complex uh, inspection. Another example, on the 225, uh, on what I want to, to show you on this one is uh, what is in the middle. Uh, is for this task, we uh, recommend this, this kind of practice, for example, uh, so a maintenance card which is a tricky, number of operators recommended, for example, two operators on this one, risk of cut and collision protect the array and use PPE, uh, perform a, a few warm-up before starting your day to prevent injuries, adopt a correct posture, wear a red jacket for not being disturbed during your maintenance activity, risk of FOD, so prepare your task, uh, long complex, complex task, so take a break only at stop point, uh, perform a too high uh, inspection because it's a critical task, and this task is subject to specific instructions that no personal initiative, the procedure described in the task and in the quoted task must be followed step by step. We had some interview where we really realized that the operator were not applying uh, exactly what was described in the working card. So it will be also a, a, a long journey, but I think it's uh, really the right way we want to, where we want to go and at the end of the day to provide to all operators maintenance which is a simple on where the risk of error is clearly uh, mitigated. So some years ago, let's say October 2016, we had many years under the belt with 139. We, we had almost finished the 189 certification. We were going on also with 169. And uh, we were launching this, uh, this point, this idea of a family concept. We had our our, uh, let's say, process is ongoing. And uh, there has been a question that I was asked by Helio Offshore and IOGP. That was, what's the weak part of your system? And actually, the weak part was the H, the human, because we are engineers. So we design things, uh, things have to go the way we said. There's no point that somebody doesn't actually follow the instructions. So that was the weak part because we were not listening to uh, enough to what was the case. Actually, we had created our pressure groups, uh, as we call it, so we wanted people to beat us on what was their uh, daily griefs. Uh, so we had created a maintenance improvement team, we had created some specific programs with big operators to keep the availability of the aircraft very high, as and therefore, we were tackling all possible sources of the problem. But there was no systematic way for us to tackle the situation where the H, the human portion, human factors portion, was uh, actually the enemy, the source of the risk, let's say. Um, so we didn't want to invent the wheel again, and we were happy to hear that there was uh, this initiative of the HHA. That's why we gladly uh, launched ourselves in, this, in that initiative. So in May last year, while well, we were in Lago Maggiore to have the same conference, so we had already done a initial analysis uh, with 139. We found, let's say, following the method that Jill was pointing out, uh, we were able to pick, let's say, 200 candidates uh, tasks that could actually be prone to a risk, uh, let's say. And uh, we launched, uh, uh, therefore, in uh, the RAFTA in uh, October, uh, a workshop uh, where we were going to do a deep dive analysis of the, uh, those candidates. We went on, uh, and basically that had been uh, our ride for 2018. Uh, the process, as you've seen, uh, is a typical process shaped uh, around the risk matrix. No difference uh, respect to what you've seen uh, before. Uh, it's subtle because if you look at the orange area, you'll see that uh, it's not just linked to something that can have hazardous consequences but be unlikely, but also something that can happen frequently, maybe not be uh, a hazardous situation, but very often then if you sum it up, it could become. So it's, uh, it's very clever. 
the, the way the process has been set up. So we were really curious to see how robust was our design and the rest. Uh, when we did this uh, workshop in October, uh, we actually were able to, uh, let's say, filter out uh, 145 tasks and went on and on to classify. The first thing we had in mind was to see if there was any reds. And luckily, uh, there's 0% of reds on, on the 139. Uh, but as you see, there are 7% of oranges. So it means that uh, there could be areas where people can actually make mistakes uh, and we're not helping them to prevent them. So that was the, the ride we had. Uh, we wanted to go on and uh, we found a good surprise. Not only that the 129 was not having any reds, let's say, but only 7% of the oranges to work on. But in reality, what we found was that we could make it a design tool. Uh, as Jill was pointing out on new models, uh, while the exercise has been done on something that is flying today, I mean, 129 has 2,000 million, 2 million hours, so you got pretty much experience uh, uh, out there. The idea was that we could make it a design portion of the design review while you design something from scratch. So we then start pulling the jacket of value of shore and said, okay, we're happy with it, now we want a standard. Because that standard is the way to go. That's what we are shooting at, at the moment. And they were listening to us, so we've been working with them to create a standard such that you can actually work both, let's say, on analyzing what's out there and preventing the next thing uh, to happen. Um, this is the most robust uh, initiatives on human factors we have seen in, in these years, frankly. Uh, it's not sci-fi, but it's common sense applied to engineering, which is not bad at all. So we are supporting that. As a matter of fact, uh, we are so supportive of this uh, initiative that uh, we realized that uh, the initial scope that, just to remind you, was on transmissions and rotors, so something very let's say, full of critical parts on the helicopters, the part having the critical parts of helicopters, basically, um, real, realized that the goodies of this method could be very applicable to uh, the rest of the systems. Uh, so there has been a discussion on what could come next. And we were thinking that based on our, uh, let's say, database, we could apply this method to uh, other parts. So the uh, hydraulics and the uh, flying controls. Uh, so maybe not having critical paths or not so many, but frankly, uh, areas where you can make it up, mess it up easily in a sense, uh, if we don't help the operators to prevent this to happen. So what's gonna come? A standard and then extension of scope and uh, a new workshop because we left 54 items out there to, uh, to be addressed and analyzed. And uh, we, we, we start liking it very much. So it's gonna be 54 items and the new scope that I mentioned before. So we're going, to, we're going to keep going with these workshops to basically extend the scope. And as we see along the ride, you may have even further expansion wherever we see fit based on data coming from the field. Thank you. So let me just close with a couple of thoughts that I'd like to leave you with. Is first of all, on the, uh, the RTB efforts. The data is really what got us there. It's taken a while to get the data, to aggregate the data. A lot of activities going on in the HSIP world. Um, you've heard a lot about it. We spent a lot of time talking about it. All I can do is encourage everybody to contribute. It's the right thing to do, and it's those data that are driving the right conclusions. The RTB effort is really, it's focused on eliminating the causal factors around RTB events. That's what we're going after. Are we going to eliminate them all? I don't think so. We're never going to be that good. But we're going to make a huge dent in it, and that's going to do a lot of good things for the industry. With respect to HHA, um, Really, I, I want to call out and thank all the operators and the individuals who were involved in the events that we've had to date, 
both on the 225, the 139, and the 175. So thank you to all of you. I'd also like to thank um, Scott Carmichael, my uh, partner in crime on this work stream, who's been doing a lot of work in the backgrounds with many of your organizations. With respect to next steps, we've all agreed we want to do uh, another one on the 139. Mateo, thank you. And um, we've already got support from that from from ERA and Chevron, as you see up here, so we're excited about that. And then we're going to go after the uh, Sikorsky S92. So I really hope that today, the, the, the purpose of today's one-hour discussion was not really to talk about process, but really to talk about results. And that's what we were focused on today. So again, thanks for your attention.